Welcome to Inside the Octagon. I'm John Gooden, as always, alongside UFC analyst Dan Hardy. And our attention is turned to the heavyweight division, which takes centre stage at UFC 203. The reputation of Stipe Miocic as a knockout specialist was once again highlighted when he failed for Bricio Verdum to claim the UFC heavyweight title. His success means the UFC will debut in his hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. And Miocic will attempt to make his first defence against K1 and MMA legend Alistair Overeem. The Dutchman has battled over 50 MMA contests and has finally earned his shot at UFC gold, which would complete his collection. But does he have what it takes to overcome Miocic in his own backyard? The analysis is coming up. So, Dan, the main event for UFC 203 between two big guys and the gold is on the line as well. The challenger, Alistair Overeem, Stipe Miocic, a lot of similarities physically. Yeah, well, I mean, look at the height and reach is exactly the same. The only thing that stands out to me, obviously, the, the experience for, for Overeem. I mean, he has, I think it's 19 knockouts and 18 submissions on his record. So he has enough, he has as many finishers in each of the, the ranges as Miocic does overall in his, in, his, in his experience. So that is going to be a massive benefit coming into a world title fight and having so many world title fights under his belt already, yeah. you know what I mean? This is just another one to his collection. So he's been through this process before. He knows what to expect. Yeah, I think he's defeated six UFC champions now. Very impressive. As well. Very and impressive. Miocic very much in his sights. Yes. Ran into both of these guys at International Fight Week. I know that Stipe is a fan. Hello, Stipe. He recently got married, and that was just after he clinched the heavyweight title. So yeah. it's been a real whirlwind for him. Mm. Also been out in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, on parades with uh, the local sporting teams in that area yeah. as well. well Whereas then. over him, yeah. just been sitting back, getting ready, an extended camp. He's leaned out. And I think the phrase he used that he was the hungrier wolf, yeah. something to that effect. It, it's, it's very different. It's a very different approach for both fighters. Obviously, Overeem is the one that's kind of withdrawn and really focused on his training camp, whereas Miocic is enjoying the parades and all the all the accolades that come with being a world champion. And the other thing as well is he's the, he's the first person to bring a world championship back to Ohio, okay. back to Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. So that's. I mean, we know how much the Americans love sports. He yes. would have been celebrated and carried through the streets. So that can do one or two things. It can distract him or it can fuel him. And we won't really know until the night. Yeah. OK, well, let's kick off with Overeem then, a man who has some 83 or 86 combat sports yeah. contests. A, a lot of experience. And with this playlist, I want to talk about how he controls the range, how he uses his kickboxing techniques to, to really chip away at his opponent. And it's not the same technique over and over again as well. Even the knees are varied. The switch knee, the skip forward, the thrust knee into the midsection, and then mixing it up with body kicks and low kicks and the oblique kicks as well. Look how he chops that front leg down of Roy Nelson. It just makes it very difficult to keep up with a guy like this, who not only is a huge human being, but can cover distance very quickly and can generate force very easily. Very athletic. In, in the first size. round against JDS, it, it was all about measuring his opponent and reading their reactions. And then he found his way inside that jab. Now, this was something I'm just going to put, explain this for a second. In the, first, in the first round, he actually countered this with a left hook and realized that it wasn't the ideal technique to use because he was trying to slip outside of the jab. It just didn't work out for him. So this time, as you can see here, he's slipping inside the jab. He leans right inside, which not only is avoiding this punch that's going now over his shoulder, but it's loading the power into this left leg, which then is, is going to transfer up into this left hook, which is going to take the head off JDS. Look at that. All that force is being generated through that left leg now, transferred into that left hook, and bam, there we go. What a beautiful punch, just perfectly timed and placed, and that was him taking that first round, allowing it to breathe a little bit, and just reading JDS and see what he's doing. Using those feints, we spoke about it a, a lot before with, with Overeem. This is another opportunity where we see the fake, just there. We saw a feint there, and we saw the reaction from Frank Mir. Now, if we're seeing the reaction, you can guarantee Overeem's seeing it, because he's the one that's setting these openings up. So that reaction just there that he gets from Frank Mir is because he's fainting a right hand. Now, this is a very intelligent striker. This is not a guy that goes, I'm going to throw a right hand and just throws it. Yeah. He thinks, OK, if I'm going to throw a right hand, what's the correct right hand to use in this scenario? And that comes from his experience. What we're going to see him do here is faint the right hand. You'll see his whole body move forward. He faints, and then we get the reaction from Frank Mir. He brings the guard up, but he's covering the side of his head. So now Overeem knows that if he throws, if he throws a big winging overhand, 
it's going to hit the, the, side of the, the side of the hand, the side of the head. So he works around it. He finds a way to throw a straight punch. It's going to fire straight through and come inside the forearm of Frank Mir. Reading his opponent, reading that opportunity. Watch this. This full speed one is amazing. Bang! What a punch. But then the slow motion one, you can really see what he's doing. The, the punch is not even twisting. When he's landing, the thumb is turned up. He's not turning his hand over, he's not bringing his elbow out because he doesn't want to catch that forearm. Reading his opponent and just finding those yeah. ways in. And in the Arlovsky fight, you can see how he was using a lot of these feints and fakes because we know Arlovsky's the, the, the rush forward crowding fighter that throws a big flurry of punches. So in order for Oberim to control this, this, the pace of this fight, he used a lot of those feints. And when it gets to a point where you're seeing him using these feints all the time, you stop taking them as seriously as you did early on in the fight. But the thing is with Alistair Overeem, because he's such a dangerous guy, when he steps into the fight early on, first minute of the fight, he starts to faint, his opponents start going, whoa, I don't know what's going to come, so I'm going to start backing up and giving him a bit of space. And I think against Miocic, the only way he's going to control that pace is if he uses those feints to stop Miocic from just, just coming forward without any respect for his power. And I don't necessarily think Miocic is going to do that anyway, but he can keep a pace on Overeem that Overeem can't control if he doesn't utilise those feints to keep that distance. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. The demolition man is so cool for a reason. Yeah. And we've seen the stats as well. I'm sure Miocic has seen them. Right, well, you guys have spoken. Thank you very much, everyone, that has sent in their questions. I think we are going to go... Let's go over this side, your side, Dan. Who have we got? Phil. So, Phil, in my opinion, Stipe has the wrestling advantage do you think he will use it to put pressure on the ream? Hashtag two eyes. <laughs> um, yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I think it'd be a smart thing for him to do. Now, the, the, the question with wrestling is, is, does he use it to take the fight to the floor and smother over him on the floor? And I don't necessarily think that's the best way to win this fight. For me, if I was in Miocic's corner, I would say, yes, use your wrestling, and yes, use it to put pressure on him, but don't necessarily keep shooting for that front leg. Use those feints like we saw him in the Roy Nelson fight and, and those, other, those other situations. Obviously, the Mark Hunt fight was a very dominant performance yes. for him as well. But to use that clinch up against the fence is, is going to be a real, a real um, benefit to this whole game plan if you can start wearing over him down. I mean, he's got good footwork, and he does work very well in the clinch. He does work very well close range. But even in those situations, he's got that good takedown defense. And as soon as he's defender takedown, he switches it. He puts pressure on his opponent. But he's quite happy to disengage. He's not interested in keeping the fight there. He will fake, he will take the fight down. And lovely pressure on the back of the head there for Roy Nelson as well. And like I said with the Hunt fight, he kept dumping him on the floor, which then starts to make the striker then hesitate. Then you start thinking, well, if I step forward, I've probably only got one shot to land before he level changes, which then starts to make Overeem second guess that attack. And if he does get in top position, of course he can be smothering. But if he doesn't, he can still use it to level change and feint and open up those strikes, open up those headshots. Because if you've got to keep thinking about which range am I dealing with, is he going to shoot for the front leg? Is he going to hit me in the face? And it's control for the fight. Exactly. And there we saw it again there. He shot in for Roy Nelson, turned off, and then landed two strikes on the break. This is really what he's good at. And this is why his wrestling is so important in his background, because he can push forward. He can really be very aggressive. And we spoke about this as well. The right hand that he lands, if he lands it at full range, it doesn't seem to have the same power. Whereas when he lands it very close, it's devastating. And these elbows against the fence with Roy Nelson were really useful as well. So if he can, given the confidence that he has in his wrestling, if he can crash forward, land that short right hand, and then start working those elbows and some of the knees that we've seen him use as well, that's when he starts to implement that wrestling game into his mixed martial arts, and that's when it becomes a real benefit against a guy like Overeem. Because Overeem will slow that pace down. Like I said, he will use those feints, and he'll keep the fight at range, mm. and he'll keep edging forward, so you always think that there's something coming. When in actuality, he's just, he's just biding time. He's just waiting and reading you. Whereas if Miocic can kind of throw caution to the wind and just start walking into his boxing range and feinting that takedown to set up the hands... Overeem is always going to be on the back foot, and that is what, when he's going to get fatigued. Overeem, however, is very good and very knowledgeable about fighting wrestlers, yeah. uh, uppercuts and knees. Yeah. We've seen, you showed earlier, long-range knees, but his short game as well, I was going back watching some of his K1 fights, mm. he can throw knees through really bizarre <laughs> angles and areas, and they're devastating. Yes. It's really hurting people, concussive strikes as well. Yeah. So it's something that Miocic has got to be absolutely certain of when he's timing these, the, these shoots. And this is, this is what I'm saying about shooting for that front leg. If you keep shooting for that front leg, 
Overeem's eventually going to time that. Whereas the feints and the clinch work, pushing him up against the fence, is a lot less of a risk. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So level changing and lowering is dangerous against Overeem, and that's where the feints come in. Because that flick of that back knee is a reminder that if you put your head there, yeah. I'm going to take it with me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, so that's where that's where the, the feints really come into play. It will discourage that low level ch shot, which means that it's less for Overeem to think about. Now, you said he's very dangerous close range. He's very dangerous on the back foot generally. I mean, here's, here he is backing up against Roy Nelson, landing a really clean right hand, and then finding his way off the fence after a leg kick mm. that upset his balance. And then leaps straight back in and watch this. This is one of my favorite things he does. This, and this is something that is, a, is an adaptation of Thai boxing, which obviously you can't use in Muay Thai because you can't grip. But you can see here, he's controlling this, this wrist of Roy Nelson. And he's also got the control in the back of the head as well. Let's just, let's just focus on that as well for a second. So he's got two grips of control, mm -hmm. the back of the head and the wrist. Now this here is what would be guarding the knee. So as this progresses, you'll see him push Roy Nelson back and sweeps this hand out of the way lifts it out of the way to make room for that knee. Yeah. That's a very smart Muay Thai fighter that has adapted his game to mixed martial arts because he can create these openings by stripping grips and removing guards away. And that makes him very dangerous in the clinch as well. So giving him less space is a good idea for Miocic because it takes away a lot of these options. And if you stand for too long, he's gonna come running at you. He's gonna come mm. flying at you with something. And when he does, you get that reaction. People freeze up, they back up, they cover. And how Travis Brown survived this onslaught, I don't know. But this is a, this is probably the best example we've seen in the octagon so far of, of over him up against the fence being as devastating as he can be. I mean, Brock Lesnar really felt the brunt of it with that body kick. But with close range knees and elbows, Travis Brown really saw the best of it. And this knee is one of the, one of the awkward knees that you talked about in his K1 days that he used to use. Now, the flexibility of his hips to be able to get that up and knee Frank yeah. Mir in the head just there. And you'll see in the replay as well the impact that it has on Frank. Look at that. Beautiful. I mean, that's great flexibility and great timing for a heavyweight. And again here, hits it. Frank is clearly hurt there and Overeem eyes. disengages yeah. so he can start striking. And then once they're on the floor, he starts using this kind of thing, which is, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just mean, basically. Not all <laughs> fighters, not all fighters have, have this, this mentality uh, it, it, to, to be able to do this kind of stuff. You see how he's controlling this hand around yeah. the back of the head. Like I said, on, on the feet where he's removing the grip to knee, he's doing exactly the same thing with ground and hand here. He's, re he's removing grips so he can hit Frank in the face. I mean, when he dro starts dropping elbows, it gets really bad. But again, just removing grips, like removing the guard of his opponent before he even starts to attack. It's a very economical way of, uh, of attacking because you don't want to be hitting arms, especially when you generate the kind of power that he does. I mean, you hit somebody on the arm and yes, it, you'll knock them off balance. But he wants to land those clean single shots because when you carry that much muscle mass over a 25 minute fight, the more punches you throw, the more fatigued you're gonna get. So you've gotta, you've gotta be concise, you've gotta be specific on the punches that you're landing. Because if not, he's gonna start slowing down, his hands get heavy, and then Miocic's conditioning comes in, and we see that Golden Gloves boxing come into play. And that's where Overeem starts to struggle, when he's losing control of the pace, like I said, which is where the feints again come into play. It's, it's such an integral part in his game. I like the idea that we've carried that theme of economy from his long range into his short game as well. Yes. I, I imagine his grip strength is something. Oh, it'd be ridiculous. Like, immense. Well, that, that big hammer that he used to carry when he used to fight in pride, that's yeah. gotta do something for his grip strength, yeah. right? The old demolition man yeah, hammer yeah, yeah. that he used to carry. He, he's a very imposing character. And, and what I like about his adjustment of his weight recently, Ben Rothwell actually made a comment when, when they saw each other in Vegas. Ben Rothwell said, wow, you're in shape. Like even other heavyweights are realizing that over him is now slimming down, he's becoming a much more, a much more, much more of an endurance athlete in the heavyweight he's division. He's a middleweight when he bursts yeah. on the scene, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, you know, he's, but he's got the height to carry the weight, yeah. which, which is why he was always destined to be a heavyweight. Sure. And I think that, that slightly lighter, slightly leaner is much better for these 25-minute fights, especially because the athletes are getting better in mixed martial arts. The heavyweight athletes are getting uh, more well-rounded and, and, and more well-conditioned, so you can't just be that, that single-shot striker and just wait for that single yeah. shot. You have to be able to adapt, and that is that you know the decrease in his weight and the leaning out of his muscle mass is gonna play into that. Yeah, the body types of heavyweights of old and new are very, very different, yeah. so that we should maybe look at one time. I think so, I think so. Um, okay, let's have a look at the champion then, and he has a serious weapon. <sighs> This right, right hand. hand, this right hand is not this one. The champion's right hand, not mine, <laughs> <laughs> not mine. But yeah, his right hand is, is unbelievable. 
but th there is there is a certain range in which it becomes effective and it's this really short range here it's a really short range punch and this this is this is something that I noticed uh, 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 early on in his career. He punches really well with power short range, but then as soon as it starts to extend, it starts to drop off a little bit. I don't know why this is. It's something that I would be working on if I was his coach, but you can see this short range punch here that he lands on, uh, on Arlovsky. Look how short it is. I mean, it's literally, he's put his fist is right next to his face. You can't see it very well here, but let's see the, the, the slowed down version. It's a very short range punch. He relies on being able to step very close into range. Look, look how close he is there. That, I mean, that is a full, that is more than 90 degree bend in that arm. That's a very acute angle that, that he's landing with that punch. His elbow seems quite high. It on does. This. Is, is this why it's an arc and... Well, you can see, look at his whole body movement. Look how he's stepped into it. So he's, obviously he's pushing off this back leg. His whole drive is going over in that direction. So he's effectively pulling the punch with him as he's going. The movement is, is the, the power is being generated by the shift of body weight. So he doesn't need to extend the punch out. Like I said with the heavyweights, if you're a heavyweight fighter, all you need to do is generate enough force so your hand doesn't collapse when the heavyweight runs onto it. So when you've got two big guys moving towards each other, he doesn't need to really have good technique and generate force. He just needs to make that as immovable as possible. And you mean this by comparison to lighter weight classes where exactly. they need to get everything to run so that you can create a knockout. Exactly. Like, I mean, if you go down to flyweight, for example, John Dodson's a, a, a real freak at lightweight because he can generate this kind of power. Right. And it's very unusual. Usually you have to have really good technique to land good, clean, powerful punches at lighter weight classes. Whereas at heavyweight, they have, they have a little bit they can get away with just because of their sheer size. And Miocic does make the most of this. But that short range punch there, plays into the, the, the crowding him up against the fence, not wanting to shoot and take him down because the power is in the right hand. If he can push him up against the fence and keep that pace on him, then he can start thinking about throwing that right hand and finding his way into range. And if he doesn't land it, he's already clinched, which is a very safe position for him anyway, as long as he's not level changing onto a knee. Now, with, with Vadum, it was much more of a calm, kind of walk myself into boxing range, which is what I would like to see him do against Overeem walk his way into boxing range. Don't allow over him the time to start setting up these long range techniques. Crowd him, keep edging this foot forward. And if he sees a flurry, then move back and circle away. That was the first right hand that didn't land cleanly, but that is the one that won in the world title fight. And the replay, you will see how short it is. Okay, watch how short this punch is. As Vadum's crashing forward, the right hand comes up, and there it is. I mean, that's, again, that's, that's pretty much a 90 degree angle in the arm, you know? And he's relying on, on the generation of, of force coming from Vadum's side to walk onto that punch. Like I said, all he needs to do is make that an immovable object yeah. and his heavyweight foe will run onto it and knock himself out. Because the big factor here is he's moving backwards. Exactly, exactly. And, what, and what's nice about watching him moving backwards, I mean, that's such a short punch, that is. It's, it, it's amazing how well, it's amazing that won him the heavyweight world title with just such a short punch as he was moving backwards. It shows how dangerous he is, and it shows that if Overeem does start running forward and crashing forward, that it's not going to be a, a, a good night for him. That takes some really excellent timing, Dan. It's a perfect timing, but, but he has got that timing. He has got that knowledge, that Golden Gloves boxing experience. You know, <laughs> he's not new to this game. You know, Although he doesn't have many fights in mixed martial arts in comparison to his opponent, He's got a massive amount of experience in, in, uh, in NCAA wrestling. He's got a massive amount of experience in, in um, uh, amateur boxing as well. They're both going to pay into this fight. They're both, they're, they're both really useful chunks of experience that you can carry over. And the same things happen. The same reads that you get from an opponent in a boxing match are the same things that you're going to get in an MMA fight. Yeah. There, are, there are just more things to think about. So if he keeps it at range with Overeem, he has to think about those things. If he then edges his way into boxing range, it takes away a lot of those tools that Overeem would use that could potentially cause him problems. Okay, two fantastic athletes, explosive knockout artists. What more could you want from a contest between heavyweights? But there are more fights for us to be taking a look at. Great fights as well. It's a really, really good fight. It's a lovely schedule. We're going to be talking about the Verdun brown fight and Andrade Calderwood in our next episode of Inside the Octagon. Mm. Faber is up against the other Rivera. Yeah, Jim Rivera. 
hell of a win streak. Ridiculous, 19 fight win streak. I think he lost his second fight, and then since then he's just looked unstoppable. And, and again, Uriah Faber is becoming that litmus test for these rising bantamweights. Yeah. Can they get through the California kid? And if they can, then there's big things coming for them. But if they can't, that still keeps Uriah Faber in the picture, and he is hanging on to that position. Yeah. Fair play to him. I mean, yeah, he's been absolutely. around the sport for so long. Very oh, yeah. impressive. Yeah. Fan favourite and, and a favourite of mine as well. Mm. Now, we purposely didn't mention the other fight that you saw there on the main <laughs> card between CM Punk and Mickey Gall. So let's take a look at some of the training footage, Dan. I, I actually saw uh, CM Punk at International Fight Week. He, he knows the game inside oh, yeah. out. He's a real analyst uh, and becoming a true martial artist. Loves everything about it. Mm. What we see here is some training footage, but they have at Rufus Sport been putting him in sort of amateur level competition, if you like, albeit against professional fighters with a crowd and they're trying to emulate some, some aspects of the fights. Mm. And from what I can understand, certainly his heart and his mind, he's certainly passing those tests. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for anybody making their UFC debut, it's massive. For anyone making their MMA debut, it's massive. Yes. So then to do the two at the same time, on one of the, the, well, the biggest show in the world. It's crazy. With the amount of attention that, that CM Punk gets, I mean, you've got to think of all the fans that are following him from his pro wrestling days. Millions. Well, millions of people. I mean, I have training partners at the gym that were inspired to get into mixed martial arts because of this guy's attitude and his performance, his, his entertainment ability. So, I mean, I think he's got a bright future in the sport as long as he can prove himself in this first fight, and that's where all the doubt's coming from. And, and I spoke to him as well. He does feel the doubt coming towards him. He feels like he has a lot more to prove than most fighters stepping into the UFC. Mm. And I have to agree, he does. This could be the most anticipated debut ever. Not just the UFC, just, just mixed martial arts generally. I mean, you've got to think the pressure that Brock Lesnar was under coming in, but people yeah. already knew his credentials as a wrestler. You know, people already knew he was a Division One All-American. So there, was, there were less questions around Brock Lesnar, as well as the fact that he's a huge human being. Now... CM Punk stepping into one of the most stacked divisions in the UFC with some of the most varied talent in the UFC and he has to prove himself in that mix. It's a massive ask for him but he has my respect for stepping up and taking that chance because everything teeters on, the, on this moment for him. You know, he, All he has to do, in my opinion, is show up and give everything he's got. Win or lose, he's just got to prove that he's got all the heart of a fighter. Yeah. Everything else can be taken care of. And I personally don't think he has that problem because he wouldn't have taken this opportunity had he not had the heart of a fighter. But... He does want to win. Of course he does. He's not just here to take part. <laughs> Is he here to take over? He might. He might be. <laughs> OK, well, as always, plenty of subplots on the card and there's more to come from us. Episode 2 on UFC 203 profiles the co-main between Fabricio Verdum and Travis Brown. Plus, Jessica Andrade faces off with top Scottish prospect Jojo Calderwood. Please keep your comments coming in the section below. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. On September 10th, the heavyweights are coming. New UFC champion Stipe Miocic defends his title against kickboxing and MMA legend Alistair Overeem. And former heavyweight champion Fabricio Verdun returns to take on Travis Hoppe Brown. Plus, the Octagon debut of former pro wrestling superstar CM Punk. UFC 203. This is big.